My name is Dorothy Flower and I'm one of the founding board members of the Valmont Youth Empowerment Society. Our project this year is to apply for CBT funding for startup funding. They have a one-time initiative where new not-for-profits can apply for seed funding. And we're looking to work with the youth in this community to engage them, to empower them, to create their own initiatives, to help them to become, we're looking at three initiatives, so basically being good volunteers, understanding the benefits of volunteerism, to teach them some entrepreneurial business skills, so how they can market their skills, how they can do a marketing plan, promotional, and as well, maybe write a uh, applica application for a grant and then use the social media to promote themselves and then the third one is we really want to focus on teaching kids how to be good tourist ambassadors for Vail Mount. We know that all kids are connected through social media in some way, most kids are, and have families elsewhere, have friends elsewhere, so we want them to promote Vail Mount to say hey come on out and plan your holidays and we're going to do some exciting things in Vail Mount because there's lots to do here instead of people just driving through, gassing up here, grabbing a burger and then they're gone. So this way we're hoping that the kids can have a voice to really make a difference in their community to promote their own location, their own village. Thank you very much and uh, for being here tonight and thank you to the selection committee for being here and the community members and giving an opportunity to different organizations and I'm really excited to represent your brand new um, Belmont Youth Empowerment Society. We're brand new. We just got incorporated in February of this year and we are based in um, on developing services for youth uh, through guidance, mentorships and opportunities to link and liaise with other community organizations and I'm not sure there's our our first page. Um, we are a society that is um, dedicated to working with youth. Um, we believe in youth-driven activities and are focused to provide quality programming support and guidance as well as membership, uh, mentorship to empower youth to have voice in their community with their peers as well as other youth throughout British Columbia, Canada and the world. So what we're looking at, and I'm not sure, next one, yeah. Um, I should have had my PowerPoint in front of me. So our mission is working to engage youth in the community to encourage development and creation of programs that will benefit all youth and to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer mentorship, critical thinking, as in raising social consciousness awareness. So what we're looking at here is having the youth think outside the box. They're not just thinking about their situation here in Belmont, they're thinking about youth throughout the province and throughout Canada and how they can have an impact down the way. Um, next is our vision, which is to live, and this is always the unachievable dream that every organization has. So we hope to live in a caring, safe community where all youth are accepted and empowered to work towards a society free from poverty, poverty, unemployment, racism, discrimination, and all kinds of abuse. So these are the goals that we would really love to attain uh, down the road. Uh, next is, um, we have several goals that we're hoping to achieve this year. So to provide membership to youth throughout the local community. And, and one of the first things I probably should uh, clarify um, and, and I really appreciated all the questions that came up at the table tonight because I think that was a really, really good format to sort of understand where the community is coming from and what their concerns are. And yes, we're not um, an, an, an initiative. We are an actual society, so we plan to be here long term. This is our first year in operation, so just brand new. So what we're looking for here is seed funding to start our, organi our, our organization this year with our volunteer board of directors, which are really firmly committed to working with the youth. And so our goals are, or so what do we all know? To provide mentorship, yes, um, throughout the local community. So for example, if a youth come to us and say, we'd really like to have a project on, I'd really love to learn about um, web design, for example, I'm just pulling that out of my head. So what we would do is find a mentor in the community and say, okay, we've got a project here, X, Organization X would like to have a, web a website designed and they need all the graphics done. So can we apply for the once a month CBT funding maybe to apply for uh, project funding so the youth can learn how to write a grant, they can learn how to develop a business plan and they can take ownership of this initiative. We can be there as guides and mentors and give them space and, and the connections that they need in the community. So that's sort of the idea with the mentorship. We're looking to the community to be your, the mentors of the youth because there's so much talent talent here in this community. I am in total awe every time I go to a meeting or an event 
and the people here have so many skills and, and talents. So we also want to be a proactive agency that will address the issues that face local youth um, throughout various projects and initiatives. And we know that not everybody has the same advantages um, um, necessarily. Not all the youth can afford to be in hockey maybe or skating or have a horse so they can do the riding or a skidoo so they can go um, up the trails or skis, etc. I'm out of time, so I'm going to be really quick here um, to engage youth through peer-to-peer -peer activities, which I already said. And then we're focusing on three initiatives that are also identified on the CBT websites, and that is volunteer, volunteerism, entrepreneurship skills, and also um, let's get our youth to learn to be really good tourist ambassadors for Bailmount. So I'm open for questions. What are you actually using the money for? This year it's just program um, uh, seed funding, so it's to cover costs of print. Actually, the, the, the biggest, um, Expense will be, of course, liability insurance for the board of directors and volunteers. So that covers uh, a bit of the money. And then just to cover, um, like we need to have, we're going to have an AGM on April 3rd. Everyone, anyone who's interested in becoming a board member or a volunteer with our organization is welcome to attend. And then we will be drawing up some long range plans and some actual hands on outcomes and objectives of all our programs. And so I just had a mental fr uh, freeze here. Your question again, sorry. Oh yes, 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 sorry, what we're using money. So basically it's just to cover program expenses, printing costs, um, any kind of supplies that we need to run programs for the youth outside of, of um, the projects that we're applying for funding for, yeah. So it's just basic startup, no rent yet. Does the larger project have youth input? Absolutely, we are going to look for uh, youth board members as well as a youth advisory committee so we can find out exactly what the pulse of this community is with the youth. We want to access the youth that don't have, um, maybe aren't the ones that came to give youth a voice because we had a, a really fantastic turnout for that evening. But I know that's not all the youth in Bailmount, so we need to also bring them into this. So yes, definitely we're going to work with the youth. That's the whole in, uh, focus behind our organization. Any other? Yes. You mentioned that there would be other groups that you're working with. Yes. Have you identified those groups within Vailmount? Um, one particular group that I'm really interested in getting the youth active is in, in working with the food bank and their food drives. And we've always already um, had that discussion and, and are looking towards that. Um, we are looking towards providing some youth business activities at the and some volunteer support for the Vailmount Sports Days. And um, we will have discussions with the other youth groups as well. We've talked to um, um, where are you? But there you are. Clayton with the Junior Rangers, and I've talked to the, the other different groups that have activities going on. We're going to try and partner with them and access their youth and, and get, gain some ideas on what we can provide for services as well. So we're not trying to duplicate any services that are already existing in the community. We're trying to enhance what's there and then also address the, the gaps that aren't being met. Dorothy, I know you've spent a lot of time on this application and, and you've broken down a lot of these costs. Um, so as far as the specific where that money is going, if you could maybe just go into a bit more detail about the projects that are listed here. Okay. Um, for example, the July 4th holiday weekend okay. and the um, youth, grandma, uh, youth drama group. Okay. Um, because I know those are two important things right. that were identified. So Marion's told me I have one minute, so I'm going to talk really fast. On your handout are two projects we're hoping to initiate this year, and one of them is a, 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 a big barbecue on the July long weekend. I'm going to encourage the youth to present to council and ask for permission to use the village property, and we are going to, we've already got an offer from someone to donate a barbecue and this sort of thing. So the kids are going to host a barbecue, and the funds raised are going to be towards buying pack back, backpacks and school supplies for all the school, uh, all the youth in, in the schools in, in Bailmount this year. And the reason for that is we've identified through various conversations that there are some needs in this community, but we don't want to identify one particular individual. So what we want to do is get the youth working on an initiative where they feel like they can contribute something and then everybody gets something in return. So that's sort of a, a volunteer business entrepreneurial taking advantage of of the busy tourist time and and really um, taking uh, getting some revenue that way. Sorry, I had a mental block. The other one is if we can round up um, a, a, a drama club. There's one in, in Edmonton that I know of uh, that I've worked with before, and 
collaborate with the youth prior um, online, create an online presence with them back and forth, and see if there's a group in town that wants to do a production. Say, for instance, we can partner with Vax. I think that would be a wonderful opportunity to access some of their expertise, and then have this group come in once the social issue, because we really want to focus on some kind of social issue that the kids can work together and, and do a project on. Long story short, they will do everything. They will write it, the script, they will produce it, they will dance and sing it, whatever the need is, and then they will market it, they will see if they can have the venue, and then they will, the proceeds, they will decide what to do with that down the road. But that's sort of the idea, is to really get the kids working, and I'm way out of time. Is that good? That's good. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you. My name is Tony Bild. I'm the president of the Valemont Gun Club. This is Adrian Vanner's one. He's the vice president. And tonight uh, we're going to be asking for uh, some money to rebuild our existing shooting shed. Uh, the shed here is about well, more than 30 years old. It was never built to code and it's falling down. And uh, what we want to do is build something. This is just a representation of it. We want to have a concrete floor. Uh, we get a lot of use of the gun club by the Canadian Rangers, the Junior Rangers, RCMP, and we have about 60 paid members in town. And there's also people that aren't members that use the range. So we're looking to build a, a safe structure to code and one that's uh, going to last for the next 30, 40 years and uh, be a, a safe place to shoot. And uh, yeah, we're looking for about uh, $6,100. We're hoping to do all the, uh, the labor will be donated by club members and the junior forest warden, or uh, junior uh, rangers and the, uh, the other ranger, the full-time rangers, rangers yeah. and uh, the club membership. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tony Bild. I'm the uh, president of the Valemont Gun Club, and this is Paul Johnson. He's our secretary treasurer. Uh, we're asking for funds to rebuild uh, the shooting shed at the Valemont Gun Club, uh, which is located out on the Upper Canoe Forest Service Road. Um, for those of you don't know, that don't know, the, uh, the club's been in existence in Valemont for over 30 years. Uh, we have around uh, 50 to 60 paid members usually every year. Um, the current uh, shooting shed facility we have is probably 30 years plus old. It wasn't built to code. And I don't know if you saw the pictures that we have out front there, but um, basically the structure is starting to rot into the ground and uh, it's no longer become safe for the long term. Um, the, the range facilities, they're heavily used by the uh, Canadian Rangers, the Junior Rangers do training out there. RCMP uh, used to shoot out there as well as uh, hunters and sport shooting enthusiasts. Um, what we want to do is uh, take down the old shooting shed and uh, rebuild a new one to code um, uh, with a concrete floor, which provides a safer shooting environment for everybody that uses it and allows uh, different styles of, of shooting. And uh, that's basically what it is. Um, the labor would be donation in kind from uh, the Canadian Rangers and uh, members of the club. And myself and Adrian Vanders one would be the project managers. And all material is local? The materials will be purchased locally and that's basically the, uh, the amount of funds we're asking for is, is essentially just to pay the materials <coughs> and labor's donated. Thank you. Do you have any questions? I honestly don't think you're asking for enough because concrete slab's going to cost you more than that. Uh, we've calculated all the uh, amounts of concrete used and all the lumber, so unless the cost of concrete goes up drastically this year, we think we'll have it covered. But uh, we've done the calculations, so if you're if willing to give us more money, we'll take it though. What are some of the safety benefits for having a concrete floor? Well, the advantage to having a concrete floor right now, uh, if there's uh, wind blowing, uh, dust gets in your eyes, uh, if you drop something, of course, it's, you know, firearms are sensitive to dirt and sand and, 
and uh, it's pretty much all sand and gravel out there so the concrete floor will eliminate that and allows you to practice prone shooting and there's less tripping hazard which obviously increases safety so thank you hi there my name is chris dalbeck and i am with the robson valley spay neuter society Uh, we started the society in September, originally targeting uh, feral and stray cats, and now due to the request, we're asking uh, CBT funding for $5,000 so we can now assist uh, low-income families and uh, dogs running at large, uh, get spayed and neutered, just to educate the public on how to properly care for animals and so forth. So our goal is to spay and neuter 20 dogs in our community. Um, we get many, many phone calls every week. Uh, we get emails, we get uh, Facebook postings on animals in need. Um, any money that we have left over, if we do manage to reach our goal of 20 dogs, will be put towards education on how to properly care for your pets, um, the importance of exercising your pets responsibly, um, not having your dogs chained in your backyard and realizing that they are family members if you're gonna take on that responsibility. We're a, a group of five dedicated individuals who just have a passion for improving um, animal welfare in the community and we could really use uh, your support. Um, I know we had an unfair advantage with the puppies in the lobby. Um, and I apologize for that, but I'm absolutely shameless if it means we can help animals. So there you go. I'm sorry to all the other uh, applicants if that was an unfair advantage. So be it. No questions? Great. Okay. I'm out of here. Thanks, Chris. I am Marie Brickbeck. I'm the Secretary Treasurer of the Belmont Chamber of Commerce. And tonight we are applying for $8,500 to train 100 frontline staff in Belmont businesses with the World Host Training. It will help the employers, it will help the employees, and it will definitely enhance the Belmont experience for our visitors and our tourists that come through town. Our goal through the uh, Chamber is to train 100 frontline staff in Belmont uh, with the World Host. Uh, it costs $85 per person, and so uh, from there, uh, World Host uh, was, let me back up, Super Host was rebranded in 2009 to become World Host, so some of these may be familiar with the Super Host. Uh, anyways, the, um, it's a world recognized tourism program and we feel that as a re resort municipality, it's very important to have every business in Valmont to provide excellent, consistent customer service and to help enhance the Belmont experience for our visitors. And um, by providing complimentary world host training to local employers for the employees, it will improve the overall customer service, which will likely increase repeat business and thus generate additional revenue to allow the employers to put their, their uh, staff through the training program in the future. Say you only get 20 people sign up for this course, what do you do with the extra money that's available? Uh, we don't get any money until the course is done. Okay. Uh, with any CBT program, you don't get any funds until you've expended it. So uh, we're targeting 100, but like you, with your example, if we only get 20, that's all we would collect from CBT is the, for the 20 people. What exactly would this course be teaching? Uh, it teaches... Um, World Host is customer service training, so it it teaches people how to uh, deal with the public, how to recognize different cultural needs of, of the visitors. Uh, one example that comes to mind is to, like, to not be chewing gum when you're dealing with a customer at the gas station or at the grocery store. Um, I've actually taken it three times and I can't say enough good stuff about it. Hi Marie, is there an age limit? Uh, no. I don't believe there is an age limit on this program. I've never heard it identified as. 
What if you're oversubscribed? Uh, how are you going to handle it? Or is it going to be first come, first serve? Or is it going to be like a lottery system? So if you get 125 um, applications, how do you plan on handling it? That would be a good problem to have. We haven't actually thought of that end of the deal. Um, but I would think it's going to have to be first come, first serve. We have no plans on running this in the future. Like this is a one-time shot. Um, so yeah, it'll be the first hundred that get in the door, first past the post. Can um, companies register their employees for this course, or is it Pardon based? Me? Can companies register their employees for this course? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Jared Smith. And I'm Patricia Tony, and we're both with the Yellowhead Outdoor Recreation Association, uh, Yora for short. We are here with two proposals. The first proposal being uh, upgrades to the five mile road. There's an existing road up the five mile hill which gives access to different recreational opportunities. Um, but the, tra or the road is in pretty rough shape. Uh, so unless you have a four wheel drive vehicle, you can't make it up five mile to, to get to these places. Uh, the idea is to improve the road to a point where um, two wheel drive vehicles will be able to go up to the top and access these different biking trails and hiking trails um, and eventually the bike park as well. Uh, the, other, the other proposal Patricia can talk about. Um, right now we have a, well we had a bridge across Swift Creek and last summer with the high water it collapsed. So right now what we're going to start with is just trying to get uh, it engineered and the administration that will be needed to get that engineering done so we can look at replacing the bridge. We just think that both these projects are going to allow a lot more people to get out uh, and enjoy this beautiful place that we have right in our backyard. So that's why we, uh, we hope our projects uh, proceed. And also um, both projects tie in with the future mountain bike park and trail system that we're hoping to get in the future. So, yeah. Yours application is proposing uh, road improvements to the five mile road so that a wider variety of people will have access to it. Uh, right now, the road is quite steep. Um, you need a four wheel drive vehicle to get up to the top or to access a lot of the downhill biking trails. Um, with improved access, uh, we're gonna be able to open that up to two wheel drive vehicles and get more people able to, to go up there, enjoy the viewpoints and, and the trails that come off that. It also opens up um, better access to the McCurdy Yora Hut um, and future mountain uh, bike park um, trails. It's going to, overall the improvements are going to reduce the steepness of the road. Some of the switchbacks are going to be taking, uh, taken out so that the overall grade is lessened. Uh, there's going to be ditching done so that uh, there's not as much erosion issues. There'll be a few culverts put in. Um, once the improvements are completed, we're going to have a road that's uh, going to lead to some incredible viewing opportunities. Um, one at the halfway point and one up at the top where there was an existing one before. It used to be accessible. It, it gives a great view of the entire valley. Um, it's also going to, I think I actually mentioned that, but it's going to support uh, the bike park expansion. It's going to be the main access up to the top so people can uh, ride down from there. And I guess I'll it, hand it over to Patricia now. Okay. Thank you. Um, just on a little side note, I just wanted to mention that um, some of the youth with the previous speaker had identified the bike park as something that they would really like to see. So uh, that's sort of one reason, I guess, that we really think that this would be a really great project. And the other thing that we're applying for is um, $5,000 for the engineering of the Swift Creek Bridge as it has collapsed last spring with the um, high water. And um, because it's not the Wild West anymore, we just can't go out and build a bridge like we did in the past. We have to get it professionally engineered. So we are asking an, a local engineer to come on board and um, engineer and help with the administration process of getting us to the point where we can actually start getting a bridge built. We're looking at two options. Uh, one would be a suspension bridge, which are really cool. 
but they're not really great for biking over, so, you know, we're going to weigh it all out and talk about it and try to decide what we would like to do, so that's about it. Any questions? I just had a question on the five-mile road improvements, if you guys were going to endeavor to try to use local contractors to, to do works. Yep, that's, that is a, the plan. Thanks for pointing that out. Those funds are going to stay here. Um, and one thing I didn't mention as well is that we're partnered up with the Belmont Community Forest on this project, uh, which is good in a few ways. They're doing some road work in that area as well, so the, a lot of the machinery will be there already, potentially reducing the cost of getting the machines out there. Um, and yeah, local contractors to do, to do some of the layout, some of the tree falling, initial tree falling, and then the road work at the end. Jared, um, I don't really understand how you're going to make the road less, I should ask you in the lobby with the map there. But are you changing where the road goes ultimately? Uh, yeah, for sure. Actually, some of some of the work has already taken place, and um, some of the switchbacks have been taken out. So instead of a number of short, steep switchbacks, the road has continued past the old switchbacks, made it a, a, you know a more gentle curve, and uh, continued the grade going the opposite direction. So it's not quite as steep. Um, you're going to be able to get up there with the vehicle that doesn't have four-wheel drive and knobby tires. Uh, I have a question about the bridge, um, maybe to help clarify why an engineer is necessary. you have any idea how high above that creek you're hoping to be so that there's no future washout? Uh, well, with the suspension bridge, we wouldn't have a problem, of course, because it would be high enough. And that would be one of the things I guess the engineer would look at is the as high as the water could possibly go and what it could bring down with it so that it wouldn't happen again. So, you know, we would hopefully have a bridge high enough that, yeah, it wouldn't. So, substantially higher than the last substantially bridge. Substantially higher so than the last hence one. hence the engineering requirement. Yeah. yeah. Just a little side note, too, on the bridge. You can still cross it. It has landed on a large rock in the middle of the stream. It looks really scary, but if you're brave, you can still actually make your way over. <laughs> That 5000 for the engineering and administration, that doesn't cover the cost of actual, actually having the bridge there, though, does it? No, no. The bridge, depending on what kind we go with, I've been told by a couple of different engineers, a suspension bridge, maybe around the $50,000 mark, a metal or aluminum bridge, probably around the $80,000 mark. So, yeah, we'll be... Doing whatever so we can, that's grants, next year's, fundraising, next year's next CBT year. meeting. <laughs> Maybe Curtis, you could give him some advice on. Oh, how we've to put already a bridge had together. several bridge discussions. <laughs> and, and just to give everyone an idea of a, a suspension bridge, if they don't have a picture in their mind, it would be similar to some of the suspension bridges up the Berg Lake Trail, say near Whitehorn, or for anyone who's been up that trail. Um, I'd also like to mention that most of the bike trails. They, you kind of need the bridge to cross to go <laughs> down Swift Creek Trail, and it's a good loop. And Swift Creek Trail is a good day or just a couple hour little hike with a family, and it'd be a good improvement. Thanks a lot, Lucas. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good point. It's yeah. a pretty well used trail right now. Yeah. The Visitor Information Center sends a lot of tourists there. Probably half of the people in this room use it on a pretty regular basis, so it does get a lot mm -hmm. of use new bridge would be helpful. Thanks. And one other little point. We have also lost our pack saddle bridge, so the info center has not been able to send people over there for a couple of years, so that'll be another project down the line. <laughs> Thank you for your time. My name is Rick Lalonde. I'm Belmont Fire Chief. Our project is we're just applying for some funding, some assistance for putting on a fireworks display on October 31st. Uh, for several years we've uh, looked after a fireworks display for Halloween and uh, due to some funding problems and some ability to, ability to not have any uh, fundraising or monies acquired through fundraising, the fireworks thing has been dropped because our members were providing most of the money personally for 
uh, buying of the fireworks, purchase of the fireworks. The money for the fireworks will be used for the Halloween fireworks display that we've traditionally put on, but due to funding constraints we haven't been able to do that this last year. It's kind of self-explanatory uh, and as uh, our introduction sheet from the front uh, table accounts for, we've done this for a number of years, but the funding of course has kind of dried up and so we're hoping to have some funding for, through the Columbia Basin Trust to help pay for our fireworks that we try to do annually. In the past the fireworks were paid for by our members and our members receive a large sum of ten dollars per training session so I'm missing out on ten bucks tonight by being here. And uh, that created some hardship actually. The, some of the membership decided that it would be best if we could approach some other source of funding rather than using our own wages to pay for fireworks for our community. Any questions? I just have one question. If you don't get funding this year, will there be fireworks this coming um, Halloween? No. Okay. No, we do have some funding assistance, but not enough to total the amounts that we usually spend for fireworks. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. I also have a quick question. Um, I noticed in the past years you've had donation buckets out in certain businesses around the community. That didn't happen last year. It's just a question of why it didn't happen. Uh, what we've found with the donation jars is sometimes they would go missing or they just wouldn't have enough in them to provide for the fireworks. So if partway through the fireworks collection process you come up with uh, a third of what you need, um, what do you do? Give it back to who? Or you have to give it to some other foundation or some other people that are looking for funding. So rather than rather than having to deal with that, the thought was not to put them out. The amount that you have requested, is that for one year? Will that provide fireworks for one year or? That would be a thousand dollars short of our normal fireworks um, <coughs> one year. buying per year. We usually spend three thousand to thirty five hundred dollars for fireworks. And so then next year you would apply again or tentatively you'd, you'd, that would be looking for funding every year? Yes, yeah, okay. if possible. <laughs> All right, thank you. My name is Dan Kenkel on behalf of the Belmont Secondary School PAC. We're applying for uh, funds to produce a mural on the wall of the foyer over there and the mural is going to depict uh, a representation of who we are, where we came from and uh, the kind of uh, scenery and, and wildlife that we have around us. So we're hoping that it can um, anchor our students and our community in, in sort of a representation of, of where they came from, who they are and um, sort of help to root that uh, in, by, by looking at a mural every day. I want this to be for the community and, and I'm I'm uh, supporting the project on behalf of PAC, uh, but ultimately it's up to the community to decide if this is something that they want to support. So I'm here to uh, propose a community mural for outside in the foyer, the whole white wall. And uh, many of you might have seen the, the murals that I was projecting as examples of what could be. The vision would be to have a mural that would encompass that whole white wall and would sort of tell the story of who we are, where we came from, all the stories, good, maybe not so good, and some of the natural resources and some of the great scenery and, and wildlife that we have around here. The idea is for people that are coming to VAC shows, using the theater, using the school um, in the evenings, as well as our students to have a grounding and, and representation pictorially of who they are and uh, where they come from. That's sort of part of our mountain school theme as well, in, in trying to ground uh, ground us um, and, and and sort of confirm our sense of identity. Why so much? Um, the scale of this project is pretty big. It'll be one of the biggest uh, murals in BC, and it'll be substantial. Um, so 
it's also a real challenge to try and collaborate. So the, the artist that we've hired, Michelle Lockery, potentially, um, would be in charge of trying to capture the vision of a whole bunch of people in the community that have an interest in doing so and contributing. And that's no small task. So trying to honor and represent everybody's wishes on the mural and everybody's style, everybody's sort of uh, vision into one big mural is a, a pretty looming task and not, not um, to be done without a great deal of experience and, uh, and artistic talent. So those are some of the things that are incorporated there. Um, we think it's a, it's a great project. Attached to this particular project too potentially is something called the Sunflower Project. And in part of our story in talking about internment um, of the Japanese prisoners, uh, displacement of Aboriginal peoples from the uh, Tijan area, and uh, uh, the impact of residential schools on uh, the fact that we don't have a resident native population are, are all part of the story of this Sunflower Project that would be represented in 14 um, communities all over Western Canada and would put us on the map in terms of a, a mural circuit. So we could be part of that mural circuit. And while that's not our only story, um, we would incorporate some of those aspects into the mural. Can we deliver this? Well, Michelle uh, has successfully implemented over 30 murals, um, most notably in Vernon, where she's uh, the chief artist of, of the downtown mural projects in Vernon and in Merritt for the Country Western murals. She's the head artist for those, so some of you may have seen her work um, that way. As for myself, um, having formerly been in charge of a CBT grant for the community bus, something that um, I had to purchase from South Carolina and uh, have transported across the United States, go through um, importing through the, the uh, Canadian border, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, I think this is something that I have the perseverance to do. But it is a lot of money, and this has to be something that the community wants to support. Um, I am a big believer in, in uh, advocating for projects, but also listening to what the community wants. So if this is something that you think is a good idea, and something that you can see um, having your vision on there as well, then, uh, then join me and we can uh, work on this together. And if not, I respect that as well. Any questions? Dan, how are you going to involve the community in uh, painting this mural, i.e. students and um, local artists? So the, the idea is to um, have the, the lead artist be involved in coming up with the design, working on a smaller scale to figure out what, what it's going to look like and on a scaled down version. And then once that's determined with all of that collaborative work with the local artists, then the artists will be involved in painting as well and getting it up on the wall. Um, how, to what degree all that happens, I honestly, I don't know yet. There's issues with insurance. I know the insurance to have multiple people up on scaffolding that high up to do an art project is unbelievably high. Um, but the intention of Michelle and the reason that she's successful is because she has community collaboration in all of her projects. So that's how they work and that's what her belief is. You mentioned that this was going to be part of a mural circuit. Um, what happens in the summertime when the school's closed? That's one of my challenges in dealing with the school district. But it is a new era in the school district potentially. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping for those sorts of opportunities to open up. And do you have a process in place for a, um, how the uh, con the representation how how that will be decided? No. Okay. Yes, I was wondering if that money wouldn't be better spent on other projects for the students in times of restraint. That's up to the committee and, and you to decide. Yeah, I have a number of questions. I'd, I'd like to mention that 
from the day the school started to be designed, that wall seemed to beg for a mural and was discussed way back when. So I'm happy to see this idea resurfacing. Um, you touched on one of my questions, and that's the insurance. Somebody has to be responsible for um, WCB liability. Where would that responsibility lie? So that would go with the artist, the project manager artist, and uh, that is something that is complicated. Um, liability and WCB insurance um, and a lot of that kind of stuff. And that's something that she has assured me is um, part of the package. Okay, and I have a, another more technical question. The mural is usually painted on a wall. However, I'm watching some of the drywall in this building move around as drywall does. So would the mural be painted directly on there or would there be a subsurface attached to paint the mural on? So there, there's currently two ways of thinking on that. And one of them is to um, produce the mural on panels and then have those panels installed. It's more, it's more uh, costly, um, but in some ways easier to install. Uh, the drawbacks are is that you're limited then to having rectangles uh, up on the wall and not maybe being able to conform to some of the pipes and corners and, and bumps and signage that's already out there that will have to be you know incorporated. So um, there's kind of it could go either way at this point and I'm still working with the school district to try and and sort through some of that. Um, I think in talking with the pack, the preference would be that it be painted directly on the wall. Uh, and that's sort of the first choice, um, but we'll have to see. In terms of the, you know, um, the, the issues with the drywall, you know, that's that's one of those things. The permanence of the mural is is uh, hoped to be long term, but you know, um, there may come a time where where um, we need to make a change. That's about all I can say at this point, Tim. And then one last, um, probably more of a comment. Um, in our previous discussions, there was some discussion of involving students in the project, and if that was possible, I think that'd be a big plus. I've observed that um, when teams come into the school, our students take the teams to the donor wall and really delight in pointing that out to visitors. And if they were had some ownership on this mural, I think the same thing could happen. One of the things that Michelle mentioned to me too is that this can be a real training ground for future murals, and that um, I was I expressed interest in, in coloring up the gym as well and putting some school spirit, um, putting our Timberwolf logos up there and and uh, wolf prints and all kinds of stuff. And she said that those kinds of projects are great spin-off projects for uh, school staff and and students to um, do once they have contributed to. Um, you know, a real complex mural. So there's also space behind me on the wall. There's lots of areas in the school and in the community that, that are begging for color up. So this may be uh, the beginning of a whole bunch of more projects. And people like Jane, who have had experience in doing larger scale stuff, can certainly be part of that continued growth in, of the project. I see red lights are blinking and Marion's starting to frown at me. Can I ask one more question? Yes. I just want to clarify, um, of the 27.5, like you said, local artists and students will be involved. So um, am I to assume they will be paid for their time? Like all the money isn't just going to the manager, is it like the students and art, local artists that work with her will also get paid for their time? Local people will be volunteering, be volunteering. as well as wow. doing things like um, accommodations, um, that sort of thing. So um, why are we paying an out-of-town artist instead of some of our great local artists? We have great local artists, but I don't believe there's anybody in town that would be capable of project management on a, something of this scale. It's the biggest mural in the province. Okay, thanks. Hi, Dan. Um, one question came to my mind. I come from Alberta and there's lots of outdoor mural themes throughout various towns. Have you thought about doing it outside the building instead? So it can be visible year-round? Not on this building. It wouldn't be permitted. 
Is there going to be uh, an academic benefit to the students with this mural? Are they going to have a say as to what is going to be finally decided and, and put up on the wall? Is there a, a learning opportunity for the kids in the school? Project-based learning is the, the future of education, and this is that. So for kids that are interested in not only the artistic part of it, but in the planning and in the learning, the teamwork and working um, on a complex you know, cost project, there's tons of learning embedded in this project. Um, the spin-off and learning the history of their of their community and having to figure out and weigh which things get represented and which don't, huge benefits. And I see all of that uh, potentially um, having student input in. So are kids going to volunteer for this project if they want to learn more about it or is it going to be part of the curriculum? It is, can be both. It can be yeah. both. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. Thank you. My name is uh, Curtis Bollock. I'm the general manager of the Vail Mountain Area Recreation Development Association, also known as VARDA. Uh, we're applying for another phase of the Crystal Ridge sled ski hill development. Uh, so we're applying for $45,000 tonight for the construction of two additional ski runs and maintenance of the uh, existing access trail. We're very surprised at the use this area has received this year. Um, it, it's received acclaim by some national or some uh, national magazines. Um, it's brought people in from Jasper, Kamloops, Vernon. Um, it's seen more use than we expect and we're very excited to see the positive results from it so far. Um, hi guys, we've been here before. Uh, Crystal Ridge 2013. So the idea for Crystal Ridge, it's a snowmobile assisted ski area. It was spawned by a group of local volunteers back in the early 2000s. Uh, they dreamt of a unique destination unlike any other where the sole purpose was a dedicated snowmobile access uh, ski area or snowboarding area. The land was designated under a sustainable resource management plan back in 2004-2005 and Vardas worked through this agreement to create the facility to date. To finalize the project and leave us with an easily maintained and sustainable recreation area, we're requesting an additional funding of $45,000. Sorry. Um, this round of funding will create, uh, bring us up to six runs, uh, 12,000 vertical feet of amazing tree skiing, mechanically clear the existing access surfaces of all hazard trees and encroaching alder, repair all ditching and water bars. This will leave us with a groomable trail that we can recoup our, our future maintenance costs on. Uh, the success of this phase and the development of the project will leave us with a project that's easily marketable, accessible, and sustainable. Yeah, well, um, this will leave Valmont with a one-of-a-kind recreation area that we should be proud of. Am I going to kick? Do I got time, or what's the red light? Go on. You won't get as many there you go. Our group made up of 99% volunteers has made this dream become a reality and provided us with this unique facility. Um, please vote to support this application and help us develop Crystal Ridge into an amazing one-of-a-kind facility. Uh, anybody have any questions? I'd be happy to happy to chat. How much business has this brought in so far? How many visitors have we had that have been kind of excited about about the project? You know, I really wish I could give you some hard facts. I just talked to Mr. Carson in the back here about a trail counter for next year. All I can tell you is we're seeing gr large groups of people here daily. Half of the Marmot Basin staff has never skied Marmot once this year. I'm getting calls from families as far as Vernon, Kamloops, down in the south. Southern travelers never come up to never come up north. They've got so much snow down south. This is bringing a not another group of snowmobilers. This is bringing another user group to our valley. Um, a lot of locals from Jasper, McBride. Um, I wish I had hard figures for you, but I'm not going to be SEI. I don't. Ken, I've been the groomer on this trail all season, and I have not had an unhappy person up there yet. Every time I've gone up, um, yeah, they're beaming. They come off the hill and they're beat and they're happy. Curtis, I'd like to thank you on behalf of everybody. I think this is a unique, innovative, out-of-the-box thinking. It does show that we do have a diversity of thinking and things that are going on in Vailmont. So again, I think you and your group really deserve uh, an attaboy, and you're doing some exceptionally good stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much. Curtis, I'm going to remove my objectivity for a sec here as moderator and ask a question myself. Yeah, dude. For those who don't have snowmobiles, 
sleds. How do they, is there any way for them to access Crystal Ridge? There really isn't. Um, it's the most popular question I get. Um, there's no way to access this area without a snowmobile. Um, although it, it, it's not alienating anybody, it just it is what it is. It's a snowmobile assisted ski hill. That's what it was dreamt of back in 2004. Um, there's heard, heard comments of someone's going to come in and fix it. We don't want it fixed. If it's not broke, don't fix it. It, it, it is a snowmobile assisted ski hill. That's what it's always going to be. Right. Now can um, like ATVs with tracks on them get up there? Like rhinos and stuff like that? <sighs> That's a hard one. It's like putting it on our snowmobile trails. Um, if it's minus 20, I'd say have at her. Um, the top section, you're probably going to have a little bit of difficulty. It's a little steep. Um, but really, anything below minus 10, you're going to cause substantial damage to the trail, although it's not closed. It's not closed to that kind of traffic. Um, due to our land use agreements in the summertime, we do uh, chain the access bridge so uh, to hamper any ATV efforts into the summertime to date so far. Thank you, Curtis. Thanks, guys. Hi, I'm uh, Tom Jamin with uh, Valmont Arts and Cultural Society. Applying to, to purchase basically LED lighting, the modern type of theater lighting, uh, so that we get much more control of color and strobe and also being able to control it. We're dependent right now on the high school system, which is all the old, old style incandescent lighting. Uh, to be able to run modern lighting, we need new controls, new lights, and we're hoping to do that. How many of you have ever been to a VAC show? Ah, <laughs> oh, great, great. Well, showtime arrives, you sit in your seats and the stage is all set up. There's mics, there's speakers, the lights and the wires. It's all there because of the commitment from Tom Jamin and Jerry Osadchuk, our stage crew. Hours before the show, they work with the musicians, setting up the sound and lights using all our own equipment. And that's thanks to CBT from previous grants. So VAX has all its own sound equipment, and then there's the takedown of the show, so we have a very committed stage crew. Vax couldn't present to you such quality shows without these two men on stage. <clears throat> it gives me great pleasure to in introduce to you Tom Jamin, our man on the lights. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tom Jamin. What we're applying for um, CBT this year is identical to what we applied to last year. I'm, I'm sort of here with Curtis, same thing, uh, applying twice. We're applying for a basic LED lighting system. Um, par part of the reasons, LED is energy efficient. LED is far better color saturation. Uh, modern music nowadays, anyone who watches music videos, light and color is a big part of music nowadays. I'm standing underneath the rack of lights above us here that we normally use. The question is, why not? This rack of lights belongs to the high school. Our agreement that we have for using this theatre is use of the theatre. The use of the, the lighting system in here is courtesy of the high school. If to, we are hoping to you know, increase our, or decrease our dependency on the high school equipment. We did this, what is it, three years ago by buying a sound system. Uh, we'd like to continue this move by buying uh, a lighting system. We'll probably still use partially this system, but this will give us more uh, flexibility and lessen our dependency on the school. Also, if this system fails, we have no control over getting it back and running again. Uh, this system is dependent on the school. The other thing about the LED system is it's entirely portable. And we, we rented out our sound system on various occasions. And there are situations, we had one last year, where the sound system also needed a lighting system where we couldn't provide. The lighting system came from Kamloops. So this is a small uh, revenue generator where we can rent this equipment out to, to some people and generate a small amount of income for maintenance and uh, other things involved with VAX. Uh, you're, there are two figures of amounts. We, I have applied also to the BC Creative Spaces for um, money. 
If the grant from Creative Spaces comes through, we are asking for 10850 If it doesn't, I'm applying to CBT for the full amount for 21000 Any questions? When do you expect to hear about your other funding? The, the government said they would announce in March, which is what it is right now, when, uh, who was going to win these um, grants. We haven't heard from the government, and from what I'm told is the government is not very prompt in announcing. But hopefully the announcement will come through before monies are allotted by CBT. Will this be a significant revenue generator for Bax? I'd have to say no. Um, it's not a, a how significant... Would you, how uh, would you quantify it? Like, What is your expectation for revenue? Our expectation for revenue from this is to for maintenance of our existing equipment and whatever is left over from that to go into the general pot of keeping us afloat. Um, Vax, I explained last year, we just kind of, we ride a little, a wave of dipping into the, into the red and then back into the black and into the red and into the black, is that ticket sales do not keep us solvent. We have to find all sorts, we have to find granting, we have to fundraise, anything we do helps us. So any, any money we can make up above the ticket sales helps us out and keeps us going. Hi, I just wanted to say on behalf of the school that we had a good working relationship with Vax on the lights and um, Tom's been very patient with uh, the need to move lights around for, for our shows at the school and uh, the sharing agreement has, has gone quite well. Um, but I also recognize the challenges um, in terms of the quality of lighting that is required for some of the shows. So I do appreciate um, you know, what, what Tom said the, the agreement to continue to use the lights as needed is, is great and um, their need to have their own lighting system above and beyond that is, is certainly something that I appreciate and support. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Tom, when I was uh, meeting out with you in, before, I, uh, you explained that the panel can work both sets of lights, whereas the present panel could not work the LED lights, that the new lights, that, uh, that, is that, is right. is that something that you maybe need to explain? Yeah, this, this school system is um, basically is obsolete. Um, LED lighting, all modern lighting cannot be run from the school system. But the opposite, uh, the new modern lighting equipment can run this, this system. Um, so this is why we have to buy a, a complete system control panel and lights is that modern lighting is not compatible with conventional lighting like we have above us here. Um, so that's why the whole system or, or no system. My name is Pete Pearson, and I'm the president of the Royal Canadian Legion, Branch 266 here in Belmont. Our project this year is to uh, make some upgrades to the facility. Uh, we're looking at a uh, fire suppression system for the uh, range hood in the kitchen so that we can pursue uh, putting a deep fryer in and upgrading the kitchen to keep uh, it functional. And uh, upgrading our current uh, glass washer at the bar. Um, it's become rather antique and so we're looking to upgrade it um, in order to keep the building uh, going. Um, our, our mandate is serving the community and the veterans, uh, so all our money that we uh, make as a not-for-profit goes back to the community as far as donations. I'm thinking, I'm hoping we get support out in the community and uh, that we can let people know that uh, we're, we're out there, we're trying to put entertainment out for the community, uh, for all age groups. and. Uh, Try and uh, keep the doors going. Two things we're looking to do is upgrade in our kitchen. Uh, the goal to put in a deep fryer because it's a necessary evil. People do like deep fried food still. In order to do that, we need a, a fire suppression system in the range hood. This thing's really quite noisy. Um, so we've got that, and that has to be professionally installed uh, by a contractor. Uh, so that's the first part of our. Uh, request and the second part is for a new glass and cup washer uh, for the bar. The one we have is 
probably 25 or 30 years old, and we're just sort of band-aiding it through to keep it keep it going to meet uh, the sanitary requirements as far as uh, uh, bleaching of the glasses and such. So those are our two things. Uh, so everybody aware, a mandate of the Legion is to support, uh, <coughs> excuse me, veterans, seniors, and our community. All our money uh, that we raise basically goes back to the community. I had a handout out there tonight uh, showing over the six years, uh, there's about $14,000 of uh, donations back to the community, other nonprofit groups, and uh, supporting our veterans and and their groups. So. Uh, we're striving to bring in more, more and more entertainment for different age groups into the uh, into the Legion, and so for that we're looking to do some upgrades and uh, and spruce the place up. So, any questions? Hearing none. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Good crowd. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> My name is Owen Torgerson, and we're with the Canoe Mountain Rodeo Association. The project that we're applying for funding is to upgrade our current washroom facilities near the grandstands at the Canoe Mountain Rodeo grounds. Uh, the upgrades will give us a lower water consumption and provide a better overall experience for our spectators and our competitors. And we're just looking to just to make our the overall experience better for everybody. This year we're applying for roughly eighteen thousand dollars to upgrade our washroom facilities. Our goal is to provide contestants and spectators with an overall better experience when they come. Improvements to our washroom facilities will include low flow uh, fixtures which will lower our consumption of water and the retrofitted washrooms will give easier access to our disabled spectators. Thank you. Questions? Are the washrooms mobile? Could they be used by other groups? They're not on a set of axles okay. but the original design is on a heavier set of skids so yes even though the septic is semi-permanent, as in underground. With effort, they could be made portable. Who is doing the work? Uh, the work is shared by the members of the Canoe Mountain Rodeo Association. Um, in our application, we jotted down that we would like to have this project completed by the last weekend in May, and that's when we host the high school rodeo. Uh, Again, all the work is being done by volunteers, and the plumbing expertise will be handled by Westridge Plumbing. I'm unfamiliar with the washrooms right now, but quick question. Um, in the application, it says for showers. So is there showers there now, or the showers will be a new installation? It will be a new installation. Currently, the facilities on the ladies' side has uh, five stalls for use. On the men's side, one. And we just found that in the rodeo or even in the sled dragging or, or mud racing, a lot of your competitors, i.e. 80% are male, having one stall is simply not adequate. Again, thank you for all coming. So that's, that's really it for the presentation. So just so each of the applicants know uh, what the next steps are, uh, the CBT committee will be meeting, I believe next week to review in detail the, all the applications and then make decisions on, on the applications and the amounts that they will they will send to council. Can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. If the money is not all allocated this year, is it held over that's for right. another year? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Sorry, the question was what happens because we're a little bit undersubscribed this year. There's a little over 210,000 available for funding, but if you add up all the things that the uh, the applicants have applied for it's roughly 196,000. So if everything was to be fully funded, we would still be undersubscribed. Uh, so any money that, that does not get awarded this year is carried over to the following year. Uh, and then on the uh, April 9th council meeting, uh, the
the applications will go to council for approval, and from that, uh, letters will be sent in the third week of April uh, to applicants not notifying them of council's decision. If, uh, if a project really doesn't meet this criteria or there's really not a lot of public support for that project, uh, the committee may decide not to recommend that project go forward to council for approval. And then that would mean that more money would be held back for future years. Evaluation of project proposals. Uh, the CBT committee is using an evaluation form this year to score all the pro project proposals on a, on a very equal and transparent basis. And, and the evaluation form is essentially broken down down by the six, the six areas above. So just to quickly go through them. Um, community need. Does the project address a real community problem or need? Does the project provide benefits to the citizens of Vailmont? Organizational need. Without this funding, will the services of the organization be compromised? Methodology. Does the project have specific goals and objectives? Is there a detailed project work plan? Project partners. Does the project have relevant partners? And have each of these partners provided letters of support? Capacity and credibility. Is the project going to be managed by somebody with a bit of project management experience, or has the organization demonstrated in the past that they can, they can complete the projects? And uh, if, it's, if the project is part of a continued initiative, how will the project be sustained through other funds and ongoing support? And finally, financial. Um, has the organization received funding from other sources, and has it received in-kind support? And then those six criteria will be, will be uh, you know, scored independently by, by the committee. And then they'll be, they'll be reviewed together. And then that will be taken in conjunction with, with the feedback, the scores from this, this public meeting. And, so the, and those scores, I know the committee really weighs heavily on. So they really value your input tonight. While you're filling out your applications, just a quick thank you again uh, to the high school, to Vax for doing the sound, to the CBD committee, to all the admin staff at the office who worked tirelessly to put this together, thank you, they're still here. Um, and to everyone else, to the applicants and to the public. So thank you very much, have a good evening.